by 1869, the Globe had a number of writers who regularly offered descriptions of the endless possibilities of Western Canada for the readers in Ontario. Poet Charles Mayer, formerly of the Ottawa Valley and perhaps the best known and the most prolific, but there were others as well, farmers and business owners and developers of all sorts. If any ambitious journalist or merchant wants a larger field than Canada can supply, the Globe promised, he can find a career in the Northwest. Indeed, the editors continued, we hope to see a new Upper Canada in the Northwest Territories, a new Upper Canada in its well-regulated society and government, in its education, morality, and religion. We do not for a moment believe that Ontario will suffer loss by the emigration of its sons to the new territory. On the contrary, we shall be benefited by the opening which will be created for all our manufactured goods. Those 19th century dreamers and speculators and thieves who offered up an image of Ontario expansion and economic growth that was quite imperial in its contours gave us more than just a trope to ridicule or condemn with the passage of time. They have provided a useful lens through which to understand the province and its peculiar, often enviable, but increasingly vulnerable place within the Confederation. Empire Ontario was a dream for the 19th century, shaping the province's budgets, tax policy, and relations with the federal government for at least a century. But as the empires upon which the image was formed have collapsed, the image provides more of a cautionary tale for Ontarians of the 21st century. Ontario, the province, emerged during a period in which English speakers, at least, might be forgiven that for imagining that the age of empire was alive and well. It was thus in the shadow of a British empire that had painted the map red and an American empire that was beginning to flex its muscles not only across the continent but across the oceans as well that Ontarians expressed their own dreams of empire. The Confederation debates themselves were couched in the rhetoric of expansion. Those in favour spoke of maintaining liberty and justice and Christianity throughout the land and uniting for the purposes of commerce and to develop the vast natural resources of our united dominions. Those against argued that the union would bring higher taxes, bigger government, and more intervention, and that this should be avoided. They argued, in fact, against all the trappings of empire that were so attractive to the other side. Expansionists won the day, if only barely, and set about using the tools that would enable the growth of Empire Ontario, provincial budgets and taxation close to home, the federal government somewhat further away, and the British Empire itself when necessary. Like all empires in this first age of globalization, not smart but assertive globalization, Ontario's guiding principle was growth. In the 1860s and 1870s, Ontario diversified its agricultural economy beyond wheat and into a wide variety of garden crops, as well as into dairy and livestock. Minerals like petroleum and salt um, shifted, uh, shifted some agricultural land towards resource extraction, and trade and finance both flourished in the growing metropolitan centres of Hamilton and Toronto and the increasing economic growth within the province made apparent Ontario's need to look beyond the borders for a new base of support. This is the inverse of the traditional imperial formulation in which overcrowding and insufficient resources at home lead to expansion abroad. In the case of Empire Ontario, abundant development within the provincial boundaries fueled expansion. There were, as successive premiers of Ontario would say in various ways, costs to growth. Only an empire could cover these costs. Ontario's empire grew in phases. During the Confederation debates and in the early years of Western expansion, it was an idea circulating in certain quarters, in the globe, amongst the newly minted Canada Firsters, and in particular by Charles Mayer. Empire Ontario had a sort of rhetorical power, a dreamer's guide to the future. But increasingly, those dreams took on real shape. Premier Oliver Mowat's battles with the federal government over the granting of liquor licenses, timber licenses, and King's Council designations led first through the courts 
and ultimately to an expanded understanding of the jurisdictional boundaries of Ontario and other provinces too, but their growth merely bobbed in the wake of Ontario's assertions in these regards. Growth was no longer simply an idea, but had a developing intellectual foundation. With expanding authority, successive Ontario governments built the infrastructure of empire, luring industry with a combination of railways, canals, and trade networks on the one hand, and a burgeoning financial sector on the other, Ontario governments of both stripes encouraged growth. Nothing was more instrumental in that goal than the introduction of the national policy tariffs. The backing of Toronto's industrial capitalists was key to John A. Macdonald's plan for high tariffs. I don't know what protection you require, he told them in a private meeting in the billiard room of the Toronto's Queen's Hotel, but let each manufacturer tell us what he wants and we will try to give him what he needs. Those protectionist barriers would allow infant manufacturing industries to flourish and over time would encourage an integrated made in Canada economy where once the fledgling, fledgling colonies had relied on imports from Britain and the United States. Ontario was disproportionately the locale for those made in Canada goods from steel for the railway ties to tractors for the western farms of the 20th century to packaged food from the farms of Ontario and beyond. And so Empire Ontario took root, first a dream, then a possibility, and finally a reality as goods from Ontario wound their way across the country and raw material from farms and mines and tracts of land in far-flung locales shot back to Ontario where bigger and bigger profits could be turned. Often built with the support of provincial governments, as was the case with hydroelectricity, or in a sort of ad hoc, industry-centric fashion, allowed, if not encouraged by government, as was the case with the forestry industry, Ontario's empire increasingly caromed off in all sorts of directions. As was increasingly becoming apparent to politicians in Ontario and beyond, the middle decades of the 20th century were the very apex of empire. Having pressed the federal government since Confederation, to first give Ontario, tax, or sorry, give Ontario power constitutionally and then to use its power, the federal government's power, specifically over indirect taxation for Ontario's advantage in the form of high tax barriers, Ontario began to reap both the rewards of empire and assert the authority of its position at the pinnacle uh, that the pinnacle seemed to, to warrant. As Harold Ennis pointed out almost a century ago, the emergence of Ontario to maturity has brought problems for the province as well as for the Dominion. The, the elasticity of the economy of Ontario, he argued, was based in part on inelastic developments which bear with undue weight on less favoured areas of the Dominion. The strength of Ontario may emphasise the weakness of the Federation. An empire, he reminded his readers, has its obligations as well as its opportunities. It was a warning that was heard in Queen's Park. The resource opportunities of Ontario had been well tapped by the middle of the 20th century, giving rise to the second phase of imperial aspirations in central Canada. By the 1960s, Premier John Robarts, the administration man, could claim to lead a province in which the service economy was rapidly gaining strength. It wasn't quite the British Empire, but there were certainly parallels. Could Ontario paint the map red, or whatever color it is we associate with Ontario? Of course not, but, but vast sections of Canada bore the tint of Ontario's reach. All of the provinces, original or latecomers, had benefited from Ontario's battles in the court in the 19th century. Each now had a more expansive jurisdiction, more power over their own economy than had been envisioned in the 1860s, which admittedly was not necessarily a welcome responsibility for some. Areas of the country in which agriculture predominated had long been breadbaskets for Ontario's booming population, and resource-rich sec sectors provided the raw materials for Ontario's growing industrial core. Across the nation, Canadians were drivers of Ontario's cars, consumers of Ontario's processed foods, dependents of Ontario's financial markets and insurance policies. 
That Ontario occupied this central position within the Canadian polity and economy was unquestioned at mid-century. But how it could further extend its own empire was becoming increasingly unclear. The attacks on the federal government had become hollow. Wartime centralization had given Ottawa new tools, most of them fiscal and monetary, uh, with which to combat the encroachment of an assertive Ontario. Taxes would henceforth be shared, by which Ottawa meant that it would tax in fields that had formerly been the domain of the provinces. Ontario knew what the sharing meant and resisted, while most of the other provinces knew what it meant and breathed a sigh of relief. Unable to extend Empire Ontario, in the 1950s and 1960s, successive provincial governments instead opted to flex the muscles of imperial responsibility, as Innes had advised before the war. Ensuring a stable economy across the country would enable Ontario's preeminence to continue. Thus, Ontario governments offered support for the principle, if not always for the form, of both an extensive collection of national and universal social programs and a system of equalization. Both types of support buttressed the capacity of Ontario's peripheries to continue to support the metropole. And so it was that for at least 100 years, Empire Ontario bestrode the nation. The early idealism, or greed, of expansion continuing to echo through successive generations. Ontarians were content in the knowledge that the nation existed for Ontario. The decline of empire is never pretty and never sought, but nevertheless inevitable. As a sub-imperial unit, presumably not all the lessons of decline apply to Ontario, where even the existence of empire in the, fir in the first place is somewhat contrived. But as a quasi-empire, at the very least, it might be useful to examine the similarities between Ontario's experience and that of other empires that have cusped and are now in decline, as well as to consider what might, what might lie in store for Ontario in the future. First, there was the experience of a decolonization of sorts. Not quite the same uh, throwing off of the yoke of empire as was witnessed across Africa in the second half of the 20th century, but how else are we to understand the groans of Western alienation in a similar period? Let the Eastern bastards freeze in the dark was a threat hurled specifically at Ontario, where imperial logic had led Premier Bill Davis to argue for, for lower energy costs for Ontario factories. Then there are the obvious illustrations of Ontario's decline in the last decade or so, like its eligibility for equalization money in 2009, like its relative decline in population growth compared to each of the Western provinces other than Manitoba, like its relatively weak economic performance compared to the United States, which itself has lagged behind Canada as a whole, but on the strength of the new economic powerhouses in the West, not the old empires in the East. Other empires ha have then seen great hiccups of angst over their shifting fate and a turn inward to shore up the resources of the center and let the peripheries fend for themselves. We th see this to some extent with Brexit, but more clearly in Trump's inward-looking America, where both empire building abroad and global responsibility have taken a backseat to nationalist rhetoric. Can this be Ontario's fate as well? A retrenchment from its position as the linchpin of the Federation as the economic bounds of bonds of Empire Ontario become weaker and weaker? Or is Ontario poised to enter a post-imperial phase of collaborative economics and power sharing? Only time will tell.